This is Read Japanese Literature. My name is Allison Fincher. Read Japanese Literature is a podcast about Japanese fiction and some of its best works. All the works we discuss are available in translation, so you can read along if you want. Find out more at readjapaneseliterature.com. Lafcadio Hearn was a highly influential Greek born Irishman. He moved to Japan in the late 1800s. He's famous in Japan and around the world for his observations about Meiji era Japanese culture and his collections of Japanese ghost stories. In 1891, he wrote a letter to Basil Hall Chamberlain, a celebrated British Japanologist. In Izumo, in the southwest of Japan's main island of Honshu, he said, There is a belief that any cat whose tail is not cut off in kittenhood will become an obake or nekomata, and there are weird stories about cats with long tails dancing at night, with towels tied round their heads. There are stories about petted cats eating their mistresses and then assuming the form, features, and voice of their victim. Hearn continued, The real reason for the unpopularity of the cat is its powers of mischief in a Japanese house. It tears the tatami, the karakami, or decorative paper, the shoji, the screen doors. It scratches the woodwork and insists on carrying its food into the best room to eat it upon the floor. I am a great lover of cats, but I could not gratify my desire to have a cat here. Lafcadio Hearn is just one of many people of letters in Japan with an abiding love for cats. Today, we're going to look at cats in Japanese literature. We'll start with the history of cats in Japan, we'll move on to cats in Japanese folklore and fiction, and finally, we'll end with a discussion of our reader's cat story of choice, The Town of Cats, by Sakutaro Hajiwara. Human beings have kept cats as companions for a long, long time. In 2004, archaeologists in Cyprus found an adult human being buried with a cat, and those remains were almost 10,000 years old. And cats aren't native to the island of Cyprus. Someone brought those cats to the island on purpose. It took a lot longer, though, for domesticated cats to make their way as far east as Japan. No one is sure exactly when or how domesticated cats arrived in Japan at all, but there are educated guesses. Like many, many ideas and material goods, domesticated cats probably traveled along trading routes between China and the Middle East. Eventually, cats crossed the sea from China or Korea into Japan. Cats may have come to stay with the first Buddhist envoys to Japan in the 500 CE, and they may have been protecting Buddhist sutras written on vellum. Or other expensive goods from being eaten by rodents. The earliest known written evidence of domestic cats in Japan is an 1889 diary by the then 22 year old Emperor Uda. It is charming, and his diary entry is extremely relatable to any cat owner living in 2022. Taking a moment of my free time, I wish to express my joy of the cat. It arrived by boat as a gift to the late emperor. I affixed a bow about its neck, but it did not remain for long. In rebellion, it narrows its eyes and extends its needles. It shows its back. When it lies down, it curls in a circle like a coin. You cannot see its feet. When it stands, its cry expresses profound loneliness, like a black dragon floating above the clouds. I am convinced it is superior to all other cats. Cats. Emperor Uda lived during the Heian period of Japanese history, the years 794 to 1185 CE. The Heian period is sometimes called the Golden Age of Japanese culture. It's the age of the aristocrats, several thousand people making up a cultural elite who lived a rarefied life defined by exceptional beauty. Those aristocrats also created poetry and other literature that is still regarded as some of the greatest literature ever written anywhere. For centuries, cats were a part of that life. They remained the treasured belongings of those elite. The first named cat, for example, or at least the first named cat that we know the name of, was Chief Lady in Waiting of the Inner Palace. 
Unlike most treasures, though, cats are fruitful, and they multiplied. By the 1100s, cats were common in much of Japan, and that's about the time that some of the oldest cat monsters appear in folklore. But we'll get to them in a minute. When the Edo period began in 1603, cats' time as pampered treasures was well and truly over. Rats were eating Japan's silkworms, and silkworms were an important and economically valuable commodity for Japan. The government conscripted or drafted all domestic cats. Pet cats were forced to start earning their living, even if they weren't particularly good at it. For a long time, many cats lived in a kind of limbo. To a 21st century pet owner, they might have looked more like strays, but they really weren't. They were almost exclusively outdoor pets. Still, they were pets, or at least animals that people had relationships with. Actually, many cats had multiple owners. Some owners even used cats as carriers to exchange letters between their homes. Owners fed their cats, which might be part of the reason that they were less effective at getting rid of rats that ate silkworms than the government had hoped. They fed their cats a food called nekomama, or a cat food made from mushed up leftovers. Cats also took on a bad rap. The Edo period was a period highly defined by Confucian ideals, and we've talked about this a lot in earlier episodes. There were, of course, many people who ignored or played with these ideals, but the government was very interested in public morals, and cats proved to be a very interesting allegory. A historian named Ray Sanyo wrote an early 19th century tract called The Theory of Cats and Dogs. And he noted what a hypocrisy it was that dogs had to live outside even though they were the loyal ones. Cats could sometimes come inside just because they were beautiful, even though they were terribly self-centered. So what do we learn from this illustrative observation? The most attractive suck-ups get treated better than the rest of us, and that's just not right. This kind of attitude persisted for a long time, although cats still had many vocal supporters. These supporters criticized this kind of public attitude, and in fact, some of them even criticized Natsume Soseki's I Am a Cat. We discussed I Am a Cat in a previous episode, and we'll remind ourselves about its place in our story today in just a minute. But for now, let me note that one letter to a newspaper editor read, We resent Natsume's portrayal of cats not as lovable creatures, but as evil creatures that expose private secrets. Cats had a brief revitalization under the Meiji government. A German bacteriologist suggested that cats were a great means of pest control. The Meiji government was generally happy to introduce any Western modernization methods, so they encouraged citizens to get pet cats. But this innovative, modern idea didn't last long in Japan. For one thing, innovations that work well in one place often aren't suited to another location or culture. This is a 1916 Japanese magazine article explaining why. Although it might not be a problem in Western homes, in Japanese homes which are made of wood and paper... The floors use straw mats that are meant to be walked on with bare feet or socks, and is also where people sit. Besides, it wasn't long before Japan began to import rat poison. The most popular brand was called Neko Irazu, or No Need for Cats. It took a while for things to really turn around for cats. It wasn't until the time of the economic miracle, the 1950s and 60s, that cat ownership in Japan came to look more like cat ownership does today. Today, pets, cats in particular, have taken on an entirely different position. The combined total of dogs and cats kept as pets has outnumbered Japanese children since 2003. Initially, dogs drove the pet boom. Cat ownership overtook dog ownership in 2016. Cats are hugely prominent in pop culture, too, and you're probably aware of many pop culture cat exports as a part of the general cool Japan that's made its way abroad. Manaki Neko, or the lucky cat, or more literally, welcome cat, is a famous icon of Japanese culture the world over. You've almost certainly seen one, a statue of a cat with its arm up, maybe waving to you. 
For some reason in the United States, these are ubiquitous at Chinese restaurants as well as Japanese ones. These statues have been around since the Meiji period and have a wealth of folklore behind them too. Doraemon is a hugely popular manga about a robot cat from the 22nd century who travels back in time to befriend an ill-starred 10-year-old boy. Since the manga premiered in 1969, it has sold over 250 million copies worldwide, making it one of the highest-grossing media franchises in history. Yuko Shizumu created Hello Kitty for Sanrio Company in 1974 during the kawaii boom. Hello Kitty is still a very popular character, although you may be interested to learn she may or may not actually be a cat. There are some cross-cultural or maybe just philosophical communication issues here, but Sanrio's official statement about Hello Kitty's species is this. Hello Kitty is not a cat. She is a cartoon character. She is a little girl. She is a friend, but she is not a cat. She is never depicted on all fours. She walks and sits like a two-legged creature. Over the next few minutes, I hope to dispel two myths I've heard circulated among regular readers of Japanese fiction. First, I've heard people claim that cat fiction is a new phenomenon in Japan. It's not. Second, some English-speaking readers are under the impression that we're getting an unfair picture of the status of cats in contemporary Japanese literature. We're not. To dispel these myths, I'm going to tell you the story of cat fiction in Japan, cats in folklore, and cats in literature, including some of Japan's most treasured works. Then I'm going to explain just how popular cat fiction is on the Japanese market today. It wasn't long after Japan became a written literary language during the Nara and Heian periods that cats started to appear in Japanese stories too. Remember those Heian aristocrats? They're responsible for some of the first cats to appear in works of Japanese literature. The Pillow Book is a diary or miscellany written by a court lady named Sei Shonagon. She claims she wrote for her own enjoyment, only to have it discovered and publicized against her will. It was and is regarded as some of the greatest prose ever written in Japanese. She reflects in her diary that, as for cats, the most beautiful are those black on the back and white on the belly. The tale of Genji was written by Sei Shonagon's contemporary and rival, Murasaki Shikibu. To make a very long story very short, the emperor of Japan falls in love with a minor court lady. Together they conceive Genji. He is so beautiful, people call him the Shining Prince. He sleeps with a lot of women. When Genji is almost 40, his older half-brother asks Genji to marry his niece, Ona Sanomiya, or the third princess. Keep in mind that the taboo about marrying cousins, etc. is much stronger, for example, in contemporary America, than it has been almost anywhere or any when else. Genji agrees, even though he is most in love with his common-law wife, Murasaki. Unsurprisingly, Genji is disappointed by how childish the third princess really is. Meanwhile, the young man Kashiwagi has had a long infatuation for the third princess. He catches a forbidden glimpse of her when her cat moves the bamboo screen, shielding her from view. This is a consequential cat. Kashiwagi eventually forces himself on the third princess. They bear a son, Kaoru. Kaoru is legally one of Genji's heirs. He is also one of the main protagonists of the story after Genji dies. Finally, there's another Heian-era text, the anthology of Tales of the Past, published about 1120. And there's a story in that text called The Great Lord Who Feared Cats. I find this one delightful. A cat-phobic feudal lord living in the 700s refused to pay his taxes, so the tax collector had to shut him up in a dark room full of cats to make him pay. I mentioned a few minutes ago that cat folklore really took off around the 1100s, during Japan's medieval period. Compared to earlier Japanese literature, medieval literature is notably produced and consumed by groups. We have a lot less literature from this period 
attributed to specific authors. It's also consumed publicly in performances like ballads or drama. And as you might guess, that means it's a ripe period for folklore, stories that kind of evolve in the tellings. The first recorded mention of a supernatural cat in Japan claims that on August 8th, 1233, a nekomata with eyes like a cat and a body the size of a great dog killed and ate multiple people. Some modern historians think the nekomata may have actually existed, but been an imported Chinese tiger who escaped from a zoo. Japanese folklore has an entire category of different types of supernatural or strange cats called kaibyo. The most accessible English language work on the subject is almost certainly Zach Davison's book, Kaibyo, the Supernatural Cats of Japan. Many of these kaibyo started out as normal cats. If you want to avoid living with one of these monsters, common advice was to get rid of your beloved pets before they reached the ripe old age of seven. I obviously don't recommend this. My own cat is 10 and shows absolutely no capacity for supernatural powers besides standing on top of my keyboard when I'm trying to podcast. We've talked about the printing revolution in Edo, Japan in an earlier episode. Japanese printers started using woodblock printing presses for mass printing in the 17th century. The Edo period also brought 250 years of peace and what Davison calls in a different book, a renaissance of the weird. So it's only natural that supernatural tales were popular fodder for printers. Supernatural tales, including supernatural tales of cats, were especially good source material for cheaply made kiboshi, or yellow books. Pulp fiction told stories of bakeneko yujo, or cats who took human form and worked as prostitutes. For example, a few coins bought you the courage of Genji at the sumo tournament. The book included the story of a bakeneko prostitute scattering fish around a room with her mouth. Cats started to show up in the theater, too. There was an entire genre of jewelry puppet theater called the Neko Sodo Mono, or the Cat Family Dispute Play. In these stories, characters caused trouble after they were possessed by evil cat spirits. The genre was eventually adapted for kabuki. In fact, some people will even follow the genre's lineage all the way through blockbuster horror films like The Grudge. 1842's kabuki play, The Solitary Journey of Goju-san Sugi, features Okazaki the cat. Okazaki was a witch who turned into a giant monster cat to attack young women who visited their local temple. Almost a century later, Shigeo Urata started a kamishibai play about a neko musume, or cat daughter. Kamishibai is paper theater storytelling. Storytellers would travel from town to town, narrating the latest scene from illustrated scrolls. In Urata's story, a shamisen maker's wife bears a little girl. To understand the story, you'll need to know that a shamisen is a Japanese string instrument, something like a banjo. It's traditionally made using cat skin, like European guitar strings were traditionally made using cat gut. That poor little girl bears the karmic weight of all the cats her father has killed, so she is born as a neko musume. Her ears are pointed and spring from the top of her head. She has strange, bright eyes. She eats mice. The single most famous literary cat in Japanese history is almost certainly the unnamed cat narrator of Natsume Soseki's I Am a Cat. Read Japanese Literature did an entire episode about I Am a Cat and its place in Japanese history a few months ago. But in summary, Natsume Soseki was born in 1867, just a year before the Meiji Restoration. Soseki published the short story I Am a Cat in a literary journal in January of 1905. In the end, the story was so popular it grew much longer than he had planned, ten installments eventually published as a serial novel. I Am a Cat opens with the narrator, a cat who never quite manages to get a name. He wanders into the home of a schoolteacher, Kushami, and he also encounters Kushami's friends and neighbors, all of whom are biting caricatures of people you might meet in late Meiji Japan. Throughout the novel, the cat remains a cat. He explains that cats are truly simple. If we want to eat, we eat. If we want to sleep, we sleep. 
When we are angry, we are angry utterly. When we cry, we cry with all the desperation of extreme commitment to our grief. The narrator tries and fails to catch a rat. He gets into arguments with the stray cats down the street. But even if Soseku created Japan's most famous literary cat, he certainly wasn't the only famous Japanese author to dabble in the genre. Lafcadio Hearn, as we've mentioned, was a great lover of cats. Pathological takes place in Japan. It's the story of his pet Tama, who gave birth to a stillborn litter. You can find that essay in his book Koto, linked on the website. He also wrote the story The Boy Who Drew Cats, about a distracted would-be monk who saved a monastery from demonic rodents. Kenji Miyazawa, another early 20th century writer, mentioned cats in many of his famous fairy tales. He has a reputation for writing about cats more than he actually did because manga artist Hiroshi Masamura used anthropomorphic cats to adapt many of Miyazawa's stories in the 1980s. Jiro Osagari was a lesser-known associate of Japan's first Nobel laureate, Yasunari Kawabata. Very little of his work has been translated into English, but he wrote about 60 books about cats and owned about 500 over the course of his lifetime. His last words were, Whether there is an afterlife, I still don't know. If there is an afterlife and there are no cats, I will feel very bad. Like Natsume Soseki, Junichiro Tanizaki is considered one of the greatest writers of modern Japanese literature. A Cat, a Man, and Two Women is one of his lesser-known classics. It's kind of an oddball comedy, a love triangle between a man, his ex-wife, and her younger replacement. But really, the insufferable man in question just wants to spend all day snuggling his cat. So there goes myth number one. Cat fiction is not a new phenomenon in Japan. What about myth number two? Are English-speaking readers getting an unfair picture of the status of cats in contemporary Japanese literature? Cat books are a big deal and big business in Japan. A search of the National Diet Library database shows that there has been a steady increase in the number of published works with cat in the title since the late 1990s. The increase accelerated in 2011. In the 10 years from 2007 to 2017, more than 5,400 cat books were published in Japanese. The abundance has spilled over into translated literature, too. I'm not going to list out all of the cat titles published and translated into Japanese in the last decade, but I know of at least six with cat in the title, and that's only including literature, not light novels or manga. You can find links to all those books on the episode page. The most recently published title in English is Makoto Shinkai's She and Her Cat, co-written with Naruki Nakagawa. The novel was translated into English by Jenny Tapli Takamori, and it is adorable. So, no, English-speaking readers are not getting an unfair picture of the status of cats in contemporary Japanese. Cat books may or may not make up a disproportionate share of what is being translated. Cat books sell in English bookstores just as reliably as they do in Japanese ones. But for every cat book translated into English, there are hundreds left inaccessible to people who can't read Japanese. You may have noticed that I have so far left out the most famous person writing about cats in Japan today, at least among English speakers, Haruki Murakami. In a review of Kafka on the Shore, American novelist John Updike noted that cats frequently figure in Murakami's fiction as delegates from another world. When I planned this episode, I thought I'd be spending a lot more time on cats in Murakami's work. But that was before I realized just how rich the tradition of cats in Japanese literature really is. But I will talk about Murakami and cats for just a minute. And we'll come back to Murakami and cats at the end of the episode, because one of his characters revisits a town of cats in 1Q84. When asked why cats show up so often in his fiction, Murakami has stated, It must be because I'm personally fond of cats. I've always had them around since I was little, but I don't know whether they have any other significance. Now, 
Murakami is persistently vocal about his belief that a reader can't rely on an author to analyze the author's own work. I'm not sure we can rely on him to analyze his own life either. In 2019, Murakami published an autobiographical essay in The New Yorker called Abandoning a Cat, Memories of My Father. And you can find a link to that essay on the website page. He opens this intimate self-portrait with a story about a cat. It's clear throughout the essay that cats have been a central presence in Murakami's life, symbolic even of Murakami's most important relationships, and teaching him some of the lessons he regards as the most important he's ever learned. And cats really are a prominent motif in his work. The narrator of A Wild Sheep Chase describes a fat and decrepit cat that is anything but cute, who looks like a bowling ball rolling toward the gutter. Man-eating cats is a remarkably sinister story about man-eating cats, as well as an extramarital affair. It actually has a lot of thematic overlap with Sakutaro Hajiwara's The Town of Cats. The impetus of action in the Wind Up Bird Chronicle is the disappearance of the narrator's cat, Noboru Wataya. Cats are probably most important in Murakami's novel, Kafka on the Shore. In one of the novel's two main plots, Satoru Nakata has been mentally disabled since he was a teenager, but he can talk to cats. He works part-time finding lost cats. The climax of Nakata's subplot revolves around him tracking down and destroying a supernatural cat murderer. I've already mentioned 1Q84, which we'll discuss in a minute. Murakami's cats are often associated with relationships. In Man-Eating Cats and the Wind-Up Bird Chronicle, cats are very much related to the narrator's romantic relationships. And in 1Q84, cats come up in the context of the protagonist's relationship with his father, very close to life on Murakami's part. The Town of Cats is a short story by one of Japan's great modernist poets, his only work of prose. Sakutaro Hajiwara was born in 1886. That's the same year as Junichiro Tanizaki and a few years before Ryunosuke Akutagawa. It's also the same year Robert Louis Stevenson published The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's the same year Spain abolished slavery in Cuba. And it's the same year Empress Tayu Betul founded the modern Ethiopian capital of Addis Ababa. Hajiwara was born into moderate wealth and lived a pampered life. Even as an adult, he didn't seem to be able to get his socks on without his mother's help. He never quite finished university. Ironically, he kept failing his Japanese classes. But Hajiwara was able to lean on his parents for financial support his entire life. Hajiwara began writing Tonka verses in high school. Tonka is the oldest and maybe most highly regarded form of Japanese poetry. It's composed of lines with strict syllable limits, 57577. For the most part, Hajiwara's Tonka isn't regarded as especially good. He moved on to different forms of poetry as well as literary criticism. Hajiwara soon became an important figure in Japan's modernist movement. Japanese modernism deserves an entire episode of its own. For now, I'll note that more and more scholars are recognizing how neglected Japanese modernism has been in English language scholarship. Japanese modernism shares a lot with American and European modernism, but it was also a movement unto itself. For our purposes today, I just want to quickly highlight two features of modernism that are particularly important in the town of Katz. One, many modernists write almost like filmmakers. They're very visually aware and write almost the way early filmmakers directed. You'll see Hajiwara playing with the way his narrator sees things. Two, many modernists are also interested in abnormal psychology. The great Austrian psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud is a favorite of many modernists, In fact, his theory of the unheimlich, or the uncanny, is centrally important to the town of Katz. I'll come back to that in a minute. Hajiwara, in particular, 
also addresses hallucinatory experiences and madness in his work. Beginning in about 1913, Hajiwara began suffering some sort of mental illness. He was also an alcoholic and was never completely well for the rest of his life. Nevertheless, he was a prolific poet and literary critic. Hajiwara died in 1942, probably from lung cancer. The town of Katz is an understated story, almost more of an uncomfortable feeling than a narrative. The narrator even excuses himself. I am not a novelist, and therefore I do not know the intricacies of drama and plot that will excite readers. The story opens with the first-person narrator's meditation on travel. He used to like to travel. He doesn't really like to travel anymore. No matter where one goes, he laments, one finds the same sort of people living in similar villages and repeating the same humdrum lives. Now the thought of travel projects onto my weary heart an infinitely tedious landscape like that of a polonia tree growing in a vacant lot, and I feel a dull loathing for human life in which the sameness repeats itself everywhere. He also goes on to admit that some of his trips were metaphorical and required the use of morphine or cocaine. But these kinds of journeys to the borderline between dreams and reality, into an uninhibited world of his own making, weren't very good for his health. More recently, the narrator has taken to wandering around his neighborhood, but he has a terrible sense of direction. It's easy to get lost. On one of these rambles, he makes a fascinating discovery. If he approaches a familiar place from an unfamiliar direction, the familiar place can become something magical and new. It's as if he sees, quote, not a real town, but a reflection or silhouette of a town projected on a screen. Remember the modernists and their almost cinematic writing? This is also where we come back to the uncanny. To oversimplify, something is uncanny when it is creepy, but in a strangely familiar way. According to Freud, the creepy feeling comes to us when we're reminded of something we repressed as children. It's almost like our childish fantasies seem more real to us in that moment than the real adult world does. CGI characters that look almost human? Uncanny. Jordan Peele's Us? Uncanny. A place that looks like you've been there before, but maybe you haven't? Uncanny. The narrator starts getting lost on purpose so he can travel again to such mysterious places. There is, after all, no metaphysical problem more mysterious than the notion that a given phenomenon can possess a secret hidden side. The actual story takes place when the narrator stays at a hot spring resort in the Hokoetsu region. The Hokoetsu region is on the western coast of Honshu, the opposite side of the island from Tokyo. According to the narrator, it is a backwoods area, full of the kinds of superstitions and folklore we discussed earlier in the episode. The narrator is dismissive of the folklore, but he also has this to say. The secrets of the universe continue to transcend the quotidian. All philosophers must, therefore, doff their hats to the poets when they discover that the path of reason takes them only so far. The universe is known intuitively to the poet, belongs to the metaphysical. One afternoon, the narrator goes for one of his rambles. He comes upon an unexpected town, feeling as if I was seeing an image projected by a magic lantern onto a screen in front of me, I slowly approached the town. At some point, though, I crowded over in the projection and became part of the mysterious town itself. And the town is very artistic, artificial. It has an elegant patina that reflects age. There are enclosed gardens emanating lovely music, there are Western-style houses with signs in English, but also Japanese-style inns. There are crowds in the town, but they are very, very quiet. And this sumptuous feast for the senses becomes balanced on the knife's edge. 
the peculiar beauty and dreamlike serenity of the town had now become hushed and uncanny. Suddenly someone falls, the spell is broken, and then, quote, an unimaginably strange and horrifying sight appeared before me. Great packs of cats materialized everywhere, filling all the roads around me. Cats, 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 and more cats. Everywhere I looked, there was nothing but cats. Whiskered cat faces rose in the windows of all the houses, filling the panes like pictures and frames. This wasn't the human world. But in the blink of an eye, the cats are gone. This is just an ordinary country town, the same old town of you the narrator already knows. Once again, the narrator has simply wandered into a usual place from an unusual direction. The story closes with a meditation on the nature of reality, with rhetorical questions, of course. Where does the metaphysical world exist in relationship to the ordinary landscape? Is it the reverse of what we ordinarily see? Is it in front? Somewhere, the narrator insists, in some corner of the universe, a town is inhabited solely by the spirits of cats. Sure enough, it does exist. Now, some critics have suggested that the town of cats might also be a metaphor for Japan in the 1930s. Remember that knife's edge the town balances on? Hajiwara describes how one careless mishap would mean the collapse and destruction of the entire place. Trepidation and fear had stretched the nerves of the whole town dangerously thin. The plan of this town, which seems so aesthetically inclined on the surface, went beyond a mere matter of taste. It hid a more frightening and acute problem. That certainly sounds like a plausible allegory for a capital city increasingly under the control of militant nationalists. Haruki Murakami presents his own version of the town of cats in his 2009 novel, 1Q84. The frame narrative describes one of the book's protagonists, Tango, finding the tale in an anthology of short stories written about travel. Tango's story was written by a German writer sometime between the two world wars. In a 2011 interview, Murakami claimed he made the story up, or that he probably read something like it a long time ago. There are certainly differences in the stories. The protagonist in Murakami's story spends three days in the town of cats and is actually hunted by the cats. And in his version, the protagonist finds himself trapped. There is no town of cats. It is only, quote, the place where the protagonist is meant to be lost. I think it's clear that Murakami must have read Hajiwara's story, whether he recalls it or not. The plot may have significant differences, but the metaphysical questions are the same. Murakami talks about all of the story's symbolic possibilities, the way a person wanders into a world from which he can never escape, the question of who it is that fills up the empty spaces, and the inevitability with which night follows day. And I think Hajiwara would agree with a statement Murakami poses in that 2011 interview. Perhaps each of us has his or her own town of cats somewhere deep inside. At the end of each episode, I usually ask this kind of question. Why read Japanese books about cats? But today, I'm going to offer a defense of cat books. It's easy to dismiss cat books as popular fiction and decide they're not worth your time. But I think that's wrong on two counts. First of all, I hope I've made the case today that not all Japanese cat books are popular fiction. Some of the most highly regarded writers in Japanese history have written cat stories. And second of all, sometimes it's just fun to read popular literature. You can go back to Read Japanese Literature's episode about the Edo period for more information about why popular or low literature is such an important part of Japanese literary culture. But more than that, even the most serious readers can sometimes benefit from a charming, feel-good book. We focus today on The Town of Cats by Sakutaro Hajiwara. I've been reading from Jeffrey Engel's translation in the anthology Modernismu, Modernist Fiction in Japan, 
edited by William Tyler. I truly appreciate the readers who helped vote in the Twitter poll to choose this short story. But I've also mentioned a lot of books today. You can find links to everything on the episode page at readjapaneseliterature.com. Buy your books through our link to bookshop.org to support the podcast. Several listeners a month are supporting us that way. We really appreciate it. You're helping us offset the cost of buying books. You can also support the podcast in other ways. Leave a review on your podcast app of choice. You can become a supporter through Patreon for as little as $3 a month. For $10 a month, you can get a lovely RGL laptop sticker. And for $25 a month, we'll send you a personalized Japanese book recommendation every month. Patreon supporters will also get access to extended episodes with content that didn't quite make it into our pared down 45 minute episodes. You can find out more at patreon.com slash read Japanese literature. One quick item of business. Given recent social media developments, I'd like to remind you that there are many ways to get your news about read Japanese literature. We'll stay on Twitter as long as that's an option. You can obviously stay updated as a Patreon subscriber. We're also at at read Japanese lit on Instagram. Not very competently, but I do post episodes and book reviews. Follow readjapaneseliterature.com on WordPress, or me, Allison Fincher, on Goodreads. There are links for all of these on the contact page of the website, and we're also working on a newsletter. Of course, your podcast app of choice should keep you updated when we release a new episode. We'd love to hear from you about the podcast. Thank you to the Japanese Literature Group on Goodreads and the Japanese Literature Group on Facebook. I'm especially grateful for their help for this episode, brainstorming any cat books that I missed. And thank you as always to producer Kaim for today's music at Kaim Music and KaimMusic.com.